really delighted to be here and to be involved in this initiative. I, I would echo um, Andy Lobanko's sentiments that, that we are undertaking something important here and with a potential to make uh, a palpable difference in our um, nation's discursive atmosphere and in, in, in the way that we as a country um, can talk about not only the issues that the courses themselves raise, but the broader issues, the broader how we approach the, the, the crises that um, are here and that are in the, on the horizon, which we will have to tackle. Um, before looking at this one transformative text that um, I'm going to discuss today, namely Frederick Douglass's 4th of July address, what is what to the slave is the 4th of July. I want to say a few words about this idea of teaching through transformative texts, um, about the idea of organizing courses, not around a discipline or around a specialized body of knowledge, but around this category of a transformative text. And that idea harkens to a notion of education that to a large extent has gotten lost in the contemporary university. That is that education in addition to preparing you for some function in society should transform you. That it should reorient you. So this approach to teaching takes that understanding seriously and uses it as the guiding principle. So it's organized around consideration of texts that have a proven capacity to affect just this sort of reorientation. Um, one of my favorite passages in Plato's Republic, a text which itself is one of these texts that has proven its capacity to transform and deeply, deeply impact um, a student, um, goes like this, it's just, this is Socrates speaking. Education isn't what some people declare it to be, namely putting knowledge into souls that lack it, like putting sight into blind eyes. Our present discussion shows that the power to learn is present in everyone's soul and that the instrument with which each learns is like an eye that cannot be turned from darkness to light without turning the whole body. Education then, is the craft concerned with doing this very thing, this turning around, and with how the soul can most easily and effectively be made to do it. It isn't the craft of putting sight into the soul. Education takes for granted that sight is there, but that, that it isn't turned the right way or looking where it ought to look and tries to redirect it appropriately. So that's what this kind of education aims at. It is a kind of reorientation of the way that the student thinks and looks at the world, the way that the student processes new information and the way that the student thinks about him or herself in that world. It's not a kind of education that graduate schools train us to do. Um, and for many of us, it is not what we do when we teach the material that, in which we have scholarly expertise. This approach to education calls on a whole different set of approaches and skills. Um, we are not teaching content expertise. Um, we are teaching something else. And that is why we're able to use transformative texts that lie entirely outside of our discipline or our, or our professional expertise, because what we are about, our task in this type of course, is not the transmission of specialized knowledge, uh, but something that is more deeply rooted in the way that students approach information and the way that students approach their own sense of themselves. Um, and, and let me say something that I hope to return, to return to next week and elaborate on. This kind of education has never been as important as it is today. As a society, we are facing unprecedented challenges. And what I think of as our discursive capacity, that is our capacity to absorb, sift, metabolize new information, and then our capacity to engage others effectively on the basis of that information, is being tested like never before. And we have no more powerful tool to prepare our students to meet these challenges than this kind of education. And this is really important and I will stress it next week. 
liberal education based on the study of texts of major cultural and historical significance, transformative texts, is critical to the project of inclusion and diversity that we are committed to as a society. This kind of education is called liberal because of its liberatory power, because it is a tool for transformation and emancipation that has special significance to traditionally disadvantaged students. Douglas's life and work is a, is a great example of this. So let me turn to that, um, to that text and to this topic of how I teach what to the slave is the 4th of July. First, the question how I teach what to the slave of the 4th of July has to be understood as how do I teach what to the slave is the 4th of July in a class like this. The way I do it in a class like this is different than the way I do it in my, say, American political thought seminar, or the way that I do it in my advanced seminar on Douglas, or seminar I'll be teaching on the spring on Douglas and Lincoln. Um, in a class like this, I teach this text as a non-specialist. Um, in the class, in, in my Columbia core class, a kind of transformative text class, part of the core curriculum, which sophomores take at Columbia and in which we read this text. Just to give an example, we come to this text early in the spring semester in a year long course where the fall semester is spent reading works from Plato to John Locke. And we begin the spring semester by reading Jean-Jacques Rousseau. We then read David Hume, Immanuel Kant, Adam Smith, and then we come to some American texts, including Frederick Douglass's oration here. So when I approach it in that context, I am dealing with an entirely different set of context concerns and a different register of discussion than when I am dealing with this text in the context of Frederick Douglass's thought or in, even in the context of, of American political thought. So that's, that, that's one first thing to keep in mind, that the context in which we teach this course is of a general education course. It is not to prepare students for advanced coursework in American literature or in American political thought. It is not to prepare students for any kind of specialized pursuit in the topic or in the area that we're, that we're teaching. It is to prepare students and acquaint students with some fundamental basic issues to which they will come to again and again, regardless of their field of specialization, regardless of their major, regardless of their professional pursuits, we are aiming to touch at questions that concern us by virtue of our humanity on the one hand and by virtue of, a, of our membership in a self-governing community, by virtue of our membership in a democratic society. Um, so contextualization has an important role in the way that you teach this in a, in a broad general education context like this. So spending a little bit of time uh, contextualizing, historically contextualizing uh, the, the text is, it, it, it's worthwhile doing, although um, with a view to this reality of a general education course, that we are not um, in fact teaching history, um, these are simply framings that become avenues of access to the text. Um, so one might say a little bit about, about the life of Frederick Douglass. Douglass was born in February of 1818 in a plantation in Maryland. Um, for all of his life, Douglass thought that he had been born actually in 1817. And we now know that he was off by a year. Uh, that is itself significant and illustrative of the way in which the system of slavery cut off um, its victims from a sense of their own rootedness in history, their own traditions, their own sense of the past. Um, Douglas, uh, as a boy, went to live in Baltimore. Is one of the things he recognizes as a great stroke of fortune. Um, and uh, in Baltimore, he becomes kind of awakened and uh, uh, tuned into a much broader world, including the status of slavery in America. And uh, he, he has a very moving passage of encountering the word abolitionist and not know abolition. Uh, abolitionist and not know what that was. And, and uh, ju but just knowing that it, it, it made the uh, slave owners very angry and, and, and they condemned this and 
Um, it is from Baltimore that he eventually escapes. He has a, another stint back in, in the plantations. But um, as a young man, he returns to Baltimore. And it is from there at age 20 that he escapes. Um, let me read a passage from, in this context of, of, of contextualizing Douglas and, and who is Frederick Douglass from his autobiography of 1845, um, narrative of the life of an American slave, um, a tremendously accessible text, a text that in fact I thought of perhaps talking about teaching that text um, and decided to do something more manageable for this, for this context, this, this one speech. But the narrative is, is a text that I commend to you as a, as a potential text to, to be taught in this context. It is, it's accessible, it's powerful, hard hitting, and a, a real masterwork of, of narrative and to some extent analysis. Um, Douglas tells the story in, in that narrative of his acquisition of literacy. It happens when he first comes as an eight year old boy to Baltimore to serve as the household slave of Hugh Ald, who was the brother of um, Douglas's owner back in the plantation and who had a little boy about, about Frederick's age. And uh, Douglas is brought to Baltimore to be a companion to that little boy. Um, one other thing about this passage I'm going to read, Douglas uses in this passage the N-word, the, the N-slur, as I call it. Um, and that, I think, right there gives us a kind of teaching moment. Um, what do we do with that? What do we do with a passage in which that word appears? Um, and should we simply shy away from a text that brings up that word, a, a word that in our, in our culture is a kind of a lightning rod. It has, it, it's, a, it's a supercharged word. It's a kind of third rail kind of word um, that, that just discharges a kind of raw emotional energy that makes it a kind of dangerous word. Um, I'm not going to pronounce the word, even though Douglas writes it. And, and I want to say that the word was a slur back then. It is not like the, the meaning of the word has changed and now it is a, a bad word that we don't say, whereas back then was a more acceptable word. That's not really the issue here. And Douglas uses the word uh, puts it in the mouth of his uh, master Q um, with all the poison and, and, and vial of that word. Um, I think in a context in which um, you have a small audience where there is a, a degree of intimacy and trust has been built, you might read that word uh, if you are assured that no one in, this, in, in a small discussion group will uh, be offended or hurt by it, and there is a foundation of intimacy and trust. Um, without having established that, um, as obviously has not been established in this context, um, it's worth using the word as a moment of reflection, acknowledgement of the power and offensive charge of the word, and then um, simply replace it with a word that will not get in the way of understanding what is being said. So here we go. Very soon after I went to live with Mr. and Mrs. Ald, she very kindly commenced to teach me the ABC. After I had learned this, she assisted me in learning to spell words of three or four letters. Just at this point in my progress, Mr. Ald found out what was going on and at once forbade Mrs. Ald to instruct me further, telling her, among other things, that it was unlawful as well as unsafe to teach a slave to read. To use his own words further, he said, if you give a slave an inch, he will take an L. We have a contemporary version of that saying, give somebody an inch, they take a mile. So if you give a slave an inch, he will take an L or a mile. A slave should know nothing but to obey his master and to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best slave in the world. Now, said he, if you teach that slave, speaking of myself, how to read, it would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to his master. As to himself, it could do him no good but a great deal of harm. It would make him discontented 
and unhappy. These words sank deep into my heart, stirred up sentiments within that lay slumbering and called into existence an entirely new train of thought. It was a new and special revelation explaining dark and mysterious things with which my youthful understanding had struggled, but struggled in vain. I now understood what had been a most perplexing difficulty, to wit the white man's power to enslave the black man. It was a grand achievement and I prized it highly. From that moment, I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I wanted and I got it at a time when I least expected it. Whilst I was saddened by the thought of losing the aid of my kind mistress, I was gladdened by the valuable instruction which by merest accident I had gained from my master. Though conscious of the difficulty of learning without a teacher, I set out with high hope and fixed purpose at whatever cost of trouble to learn how to read. That is, um, an extraordinary passage and it gets precisely at the liberatory power of learning precisely at the kind of unfitting for docility and servitude that a liberal education an education based on this idea of education as transformation transformative text it gets precisely at what that kind of education does so Douglas, I think, is a particularly suitable text because it's one which, with, with which the students can identify in their own process of coming to consciousness, in their own, in their own process of kind of inner unfolding. Um, that notion that learning would forever unfit him for, for, for slavery. Um, it's worth putting before our students and asking ourselves it, to what extent we today live with forms of coercion and servitude and enslavement, obviously not chattel slavery, but other forms of coercion and servitude and the place of education, their own education, or education more broadly in addressing that situation today. Um, so Douglas um, eventually does escape using precisely this literary literacy that he has um, that he has obtained. Um, he makes it his business to learn to perfect his reading skills. He makes it his business to teach every uh, fellow slave that he can how to, how to read and write, and eventually um, escapes from Maryland, from Baltimore, using uh, papers of a, of a free black uh, sailor, and makes it to New York and then out to uh, New Bedford, where he settles in. And from where, before long, he comes to the attention of William Lloyd Garrison, who uh, was the kind of firebrand abolitionist and the founder of the Massachusetts and American anti-slavery societies. Um, Garrison hears Douglas speak, hires him as a lecturer in the abolitionist cause, and uh, Douglas, after a few years lecturing, uh, telling his story, writes the narrative that, that from which, from, from which I, I just read to you. After Douglas writes the narrative, Douglas um, has to flee to, to England because in the narrative he names names and makes himself identifiable and subject to uh, capture and return to slavery under the provisions of um, the, the constitutional mandate to, to uh, on fugitive slaves. Uh, so Douglas escapes and, and uh, while he's away, he, he, some friends managed to raise funds to buy his freedom. He buys his own freedom and returns to America as a free man and settles in Rochester, New York, where in 1852, he is invited to give this speech that's before us, the 4th of July address. Um, he is invited by the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. And um, in keeping with tradition, um, Douglas insists on giving this speech on July the 5th. Um, and you might, when you're teaching this, you might ask the students that it's, Douglas keeps with tr the tradition of black abolitionists in um, insisting that the speech be given on the 5th of July. Um, and that's a, immediately opens a 
a good discussion question to have students pause and consider the significance of that or the motivations. What, what does it mean to insist on giving a 4th of July address by a black man on the 5th of July? Um, that is sure to generate some, some, some interesting thinking. Um, another thing that you might do in teaching this text from the beginning is to, uh, this text provides an occasion to grapple and consider the reality of slavery in America. Um, that reality is indispensable in framing this speech. And in fact, not long into his speech, Douglas says, you know what? My subject today is really slavery. Um, you don't have to spend a, a, a lot of time on it, but it's, it's worth putting it front, front and center because the question of slavery is not only central in Douglas's time, but continues to be a central feature of the problems that we face today. Uh, not just racial problems, and of course, we're in a moment of, of, of heightened uh, tension and uh, awareness of the continuing legacy of racial discrimination and white supremacism in this country. Um, to, because of that relevance, not only in Douglas's time, but in today's time, uh, it's worth putting, bringing this out uh, because so many of our, of our political problems today are rooted in that historical reality. Um, and you know, to, to, to say just the plainest thing about it, um, by the early 1800s, 12 million, 12 million people had been kidnapped from the coast of Africa and shipped to the new world. Um, as, as many as 10% died en route um, and then were, were, were brought to the new world and, and traded and exploited um, and in some ways, their presence in the American political landscape has, throughout American history, become the test case, the most prominent test case for the viability of American political ideas. That is a nation that was founded on the idea of equality um, and uh, democracy has this ugly reality at its center and working out that reality has always been the crucible of American ideas, uh, of American uh, ideals, and uh, therefore uh, an indispensable place to um, to stop to think about the meaning, the meaning of America. Um, when I teach this text, I also have students write a response to the text before class, and this is uh, a little pedagogical tool that I use not just for this text, but in general in in these courses. Uh, to have students constantly thinking about and articulating, grappling with in written form, the ideas that they encounter and the reactions that they have to the ideas they encounter. Um, that is a, it, it, it's such a powerful and simple tool because it, 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 it makes students pause, meditate, read carefully, and then arrive at class with some formed thoughts, some formed reactions, um, which often find their way into class discussion. Um, it is a great kind of preparation for the kinds of discussion that I hope to have in class. Um, and just as an example of that, I, I uh, assigned this text this semester in my, in my core seminar um, and had students write a response. And I want to just read a response from one of my students. Um, and, I, and I read this response not because it is representative of the responses I got, but because it is um, exemplary. It is, it is illustrative of the kind of thing that you might get from students and the kind of thinking that this text provokes in students. Um, so I know I've been reading a lot of quotes and I tend to do that in my own teaching and um, I hope you um, can uh, bear it. So this is from a sophomore um, who read, read this text for the first time. When I was reading this, I was in constant in a constant state of awe. In every line I read, I felt the full force of Douglas's brilliant intellect and, or and oration powers. I am, by the way, reading this exactly as it was written. My reading experience reminded me of the time when I watched a master Chinese calligrapher write lines of calligraphy across a giant piece of paper. Each brush stroke was deliberate, clean, fluid, and expressed his intentions to the greatest extent. Douglas is a master of words and structure. 
He structures this speech so that he begins with an extensive history lesson on the founding fathers' fight for freedom and justice, which has the effect of making the audience at ease and having them rejoice in their values of independence and liberty. Then Douglas jumps to the present and sharply points out that he and his fellow people are excluded from this freedom and justice and begins the attack on the grotesque hypocrisy that exists in America. This way of structuring is really amazing and effective because by reminding the audience of America's founding value and drawing parallels between the colony's struggle for freedom and the slave struggle to gain freedom, Douglas makes it hard for the audience to not support the anti-slavery movement and view it as a justified revolt against an oppressor. Throughout the speech, Douglas ingeniously backs the audience into tight corners where for them to continue feeling that they are upholding the glorious values of freedom and America, they have to forcefully denounce slavery. Douglas achieves this by aligning himself with the right side of history, with religion, and with basic American values. So if the audience disagreed with him, it would be at odds with all those things. While I am no stranger to, the Ameri to America's gross hypocrisy and violent injustice, reading Douglas' account of them still packs a punch. As someone who, along with her family, came to America for a better life because we believed America to be the land of opportunity and freedom, it is always jarring to come face to face with America's bloody and ugly past, which also extends into the present. The idea of America that my family worshipped and sought after is so different from what it actually was and is. A big part of growing up was learning to think critically about US history and rejecting the simple and glorified versions of history that were force fed to me in school and the media. However, what makes it devastating is that almost 200 years later, Douglas's speech is still so relevant today and America's shameless hypocrisy is still around. It really feels like he was writing this speech on July 4th, 2020. Um, so many of the important themes and rhetorical approach that Douglas takes here are, are, are captured beautifully in this, in this student response. Um, but I, I hope that you can see, you can hear how, uh, how struck this student is, how this, uh, this speech hit home. And uh, something I love about this is that, is that the student is able to weave in her own experience. And you know, there's that, that reference to um, seeing a Chinese calligrapher and the reference to her own immigration and her family's ideals about America and the contrast between the reality and the, and the, um, the myth, the tension between the ideals and the implementation. Um, these are precisely the questions that this text puts in front of the classroom, precisely the kinds of questions that this text gives us an occasion to grapple with, an occasion to uh, help work through and metabolize. So it is a text that, that you know, even though I've, I've been teaching this text for many years, um, in the wake of the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and the racial tensions um, brought to the surface by the recent um, incidents of police brutality against Blacks, um, it is a text that has a, a special relevance at this moment. Um, and one of the things that it does is this very, very difficult thing of acknowledging and honoring the power and revolutionary potential of American ideals. And at the same time, harshly and unabashedly criticizing the failings of American society to live up to those ideals. That balance or that tension that capacity to hold this complex reality in view is something that is um, so inspiring to see, so instructive to see, um, such a powerful model for students to, to encounter. So um, talking about the speech, um, at the bottom, kind of a central question of this speech is what does it mean to be a black person in America? What does it mean to be a black American? And the way that Douglas treats, treats the speech raises the question or addresses the question, what does it mean to be an American period? Um, so as I said, the, 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 Afri the issues that, that, that the African American experience bring up uh, put to the test and are a kind of paradigmatic place of um, uh, contest 
about the meaning of American ideals. And that's what this, that's what the speech does. The speech comes roughly in, in kind of four movements, four parts. Um, the first movement is a, an acknowledgement of the significance of the 4th of July in a kind of grand stage. Um, and one of the things that you see in that, in, in that section is that Douglas is a careful and deep reader of history. Um, he knows, he's done his homework in understanding the circumstances and development of the moments that the 4th of July celebrates the, and the documents that the 4th of July celebrates, namely the Declaration of Independence. Um, and the uh, significance of the founding fathers' ideas and revolution. Um, maybe I'll read a passage uh, in a minute from that first section. Then comes the second and most uh, famous and vigorous, longest part of the speech in which Douglas denounces the practice of slavery in America and the hypocrisy of celebrating in the middle of a slave of a slave country, celebrating the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. Um, then comes a third movement that I think is absolutely um, central, and which really sadly is often anthologized out of this speech. Uh, this speech often is um, put in anthologies or read in excerpt form. And this uh, third section is a section that is often taken out. And it is a section of the Constitution. It is a section in which Douglas, having already praised the Declaration of Independence, comes to the Constitution and makes an argument that the Constitution is a, a glorious liberty document, he says. Uh, makes an argument that a, a reading of the Constitution as a slave holding as a, a supporting slavery is actually a mistake. Uh, and that he's actually changed his mind about this because he used to think that the constitution supported slavery. Um, but he has come to, uh, in his own process of intellectual growth and his own research on legal interpretation has come to a reading of the constitution as a glorious liberty document and an understanding of American citizenship as a commitment to interpretation of the constitution in the service of liberty. There's a, this remarkable vision of a uh, interpreter citizen um, that, that Douglas develops, a, a notably a deracialized notion of American citizenship. Um, and Douglas would uphold and advance this notion even in the face five years after this speech, the 1857 Supreme Court decision on the Dred Scott case where Judge, Judge um, Tan, uh, who writes the opinion, um, explicitly says that the meaning of the Declaration of Independence claim of equality did not apply to black people, that a black person could not be a citizen of the United States. And Douglas, grounded in, in, some, in this understanding of American citizenship as an interpretive citizenship, uh, argues against the Supreme Court's uh, reading of the Constitution, uh, and um, you know, as we all know, it is a low and shameful moment in American jurisprudence, which was um, soundly and and categorically rejected um, by 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 our own legal system later on. Then the last movement of the of the the closing movement of the speech is a hopeful movement, is an, an, af an affirmation of his sense of hope, an affirmation of his sense of history, um, and, and uh, looking forward to a moment in which the, the forces of history, uh, the movement of, of freedom's progress uh, prevails in America, a moment of hope, uh, a movement of hope in uh, America's future and America's potential. So that's broadly what we have here. Um, it's it, one of the ways if you, are, if you are kind of, as a teacher, minded this way, this speech is a, is a tremendous uh, oratorical performance. So you can, you can teach oratory, you can teach the art of persuasion. 
um, by, by looking just structurally at this speech. Um, so I don't have that much time left, but let me point to some key moments in those, in, in those movements. Douglas begins by, um, by saying, and by the way, it's kind of very dramatic moments. There are about 600 people at Corinthian Hall. Corinthian Hall uh, was a then new venue opened in Rochester for um, performances and festivals. And it was a kind of a grand hall with large windows and chandeliers, um, uh, just a, a beautiful, beautiful space. 600 people are part, packed in there for this occasion. Um, and Douglas, before Douglas comes up to speak, there is a reading of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and then without introduction, Douglas comes up to the podium. Um, and he begins his speech by saying, I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my own ability that I do today than I do today. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. Um, and there are eyewitness accounts that say that his, that his hands were, were, were shaking as he began to, to speak. But one question um, you might ask your students is whether this uh, open is just standard rhetorical posturing. You know, it's the kind of a locus classicus that you, you begin a speech by um, uh, lowering the expectations by by lamenting your unfitness to meet the moment rhetorically uh, is that is that what's going on here or uh, does Douglas in fact have reason to approach this occasion with special apprehension um, what is the nature of the task before Douglas on an occasion like this why might it pose particular challenges um, and uh, also in this, this kind of introductory uh, set of remarks, Douglas writes, the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. Uh, you know, the, the, an understatement for the ages. Um, he says later that I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as gratitude. Um, then he begins his exposition, very short, but so penetrating, uh, exposition of the circumstances of the revolution and America's Declaration of Independence. Um, you will note, your students will note his play between this is your 4th of July, your founding fathers, your holiday. At the same time, he drops every now and then fellow citizens. Um, so there is both an, uh, an inclusion and a distancing. Uh, the way that that plays out is, is, is fascinating to see and, and, and very, very effective. Um, he has a little line in praising the, the, the founders in which he says, with brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just drops that little line there. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Um, and Douglas hints here at the legitimacy of violence against slavery. Um, there is a, Lonnie had told me that one can, can share, um, that I could, could share. So let me see if I can share this, this image. Can people see that, that image there? That is a, the frontispiece of um, Douglas's second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom. Um, and that, th this line in this speech, with brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression somehow reminds me of this, of this image of Douglas. Um, Douglas, by the way, um, scholars who've looked into this uh, said that he was the most photographed person in the 19th century, uh, which is a remarkable uh, fact or factoid. Or he is, he, there are so many portraits, port portraits of Douglas and just a study of the portraiture of Douglas, uh, it's a fascinating exercise in itself. This portrait, um, to accompany a second autobiography, to my mind, embodies this notion that with brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. There's that, that gravity in his, in his look. Uh, he never smiled in all these portraits that we have. I mean, there's not one in which he's smiling. Uh, smiling wasn't a, a convention, wasn't a thing 
in, in early photography like it is today, where you're supposed to smile at pictures. Uh, nonetheless, Douglas's um, uh, fixed gaze at the, at, at the camera and uh, his posture of kind of dignity and um, uh, up, uprightness um, is, is significant. And notice his, uh, his hands, right? They are, they are formed into fists. Um, you get the sense here that Douglas is uh, telling you something very important and that he is not going to uh, put up with oppression, that he um, uh, has a remedy if, if in mind if words don't suffice. Um, and that, uh, that notion raises um, this question of, of the use of violence. Um, Doug, this is a question that Douglas had to, ha had to face and um, Douglas aligns the legitimacy of the use of violence by slaves with the same uh, uh, natural rights doctrine that justified the founders' recourse to violence in the face of oppression. He is, as, as that student noted in her response, he is aligning the cause of the slave with the cause of the American founding. Um, so what to the slave is the 4th of July? Among other things, it is an uh, articulation of the very same principles under which the slave can uh, resist and if necessary, uh, revolt against his or her oppressor. Um, he says also the founding fathers that they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. Uh, with them, he says, there was nothing settled that was not right. Um, there's a passage which, uh, which I don't have time to read in which he goes at length, uh, goes on at length about the um, heroism of the founders. He calls them great men. He calls them uh, heroic, brave, statesmen, patriots. Uh, he really, heroes, he calls them. He does not hold back in his praise of the founders, um, which, is, which is an important point because one question I like to ask students is to put that paragraph in which he calls the founders great men and heroes, um, to put it next to what is perhaps the most famous passage in, in the oration, which I am going to read to you right now, it comes in that second denunciatory section. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bomb bombast, fraud, deception, impiety and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. One of the things to note about this, you know, just so powerful denunciation, uh, it's the, how it ends. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices. That, that word nation there, uh, Douglas is clear eyed about the fact that slavery is not a Southern problem. Uh, slavery is a national problem. There is not a nation, right? Everybody gets included. More shocking a nation uh, on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of this United States at this very hour. Again, the people of this United States at this very hour are personally implicated in this. Um, so I like to ask, to ask students how they, uh, how the, they square this 
with the passage praising the founders. Um, how does how can Douglas square it? How can they square it? And that, of course, is a version of uh, the thing that we're agonizing about today. How do we square our um, adherence to law and order and, uh, and freedom and civil rights and human rights with the practices that we see um, that, have been, that, that have been caught on tape and that uh, every African American uh, knows in the flesh? Um, you know, for many people, it was a shocking revelation to see that because it's simply not their experience of law enforcement, their experience of the justice system in the United States. How do we square um, those, how do we put those things together? Um, so Douglas, I think um, studying Douglas is, is, is studying how to live with that, with that contradiction, how to live with that um, uh, paradox. Um, Douglas then, um, and, and I don't want time to go through this, but I, I, I do want to point out that Douglas says, you know, what, uh, what should, I'm going to talk about slavery. What do you, do you want me to do? Do you want to um, uh, argue that, that, that slaves are people, that slaves are human beings? I, I, I don't, that's, there's no point in arguing that your laws uh, acknowledge that. Your laws forbidding people to, to teach them to read. Um, your laws um, that treat them in a legal system as culpable for offenses already grant the, the slave's humanity. Uh, am I to just argue that slavery is wrong? There's no point in doing that either. And then he has this line that I love. There is not a man under the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. Um, that just kind of blows everything out of the water. Everybody understands slavery is wrong for him. Um, and then he does this, this um, Thing. He says, what I can do is, is, is denounce slavery. Um, and he does this kind of literary device in which he imagines um, he, a, a slave um, uh, a group of slaves being transported from the slave market in the Potomac down to uh, New Orleans. And he says, you know, see the old man with locks thin, thinned and gray, the young mother with babe in her arms, the girl of 13 weeping. He talks about hearing as a child in Baltimore, the chains being dragged of, this group, of, of groups of slaves are being transported from the market to a ship, to the docks. Um, and the uh, un, unearthly cries of agony, uh, sometimes by mothers by, uh, and by others, they're being dragged before daybreak. Um, this uh, humanization of the experience, which is done in what, what is a, a literary passage here, right? Douglas imagines and portrays um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of fiction, uh, a kind of dramatization of the experience of slavery. Um, and that, you know, it's one of the tools that Douglas has at his disposal. Um, that is literary representation to bring home the humanity and the bar the humanity of the slave and the barbarity barbarity of the slave system. Um, in connection to that, you might remember uh, that Uncle Tom's Cabin had just come out uh, a little over a year um, before this speech, and Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is precisely just extraordinary humanization of the slave and dramatization of the brutality of slavery had a, a kind of an electric impact on the American public. Um, in, it, 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 it probably made more abolitionists than any other single intervention by anybody or turned people against slavery more than any other single intervention. Douglas is aware of the power um, of literature and of the power of representation in advancing this cause. Um, if I had more time, I would look at uh, those passages on the Constitution whose importance I have, I have already highlighted. Um, one thing there is uh, that I have found very productive in the classroom is to ask student, students to themselves debate the question of whether the Constitution, that is the pre-Civil War Constitution, the Constitution without the Civil War amendments, um, is pro-slavery or anti-slavery? 
is this a document that establishes a slave republic or is it a, a document that establishes a, um, a republic where slavery could not uh, persist and could not thrive? Um, okay, I'll stop there. I hope that this has been useful in both uh, showing how this text fits in that description of a transformative text and is a suitable text for using courses like this and uh, how you might approach, even if you're not a Douglas expert, teaching a text in a, in a liberal arts general education classroom.